And now I'd like to, to restart uh, by, by inviting here Professor Salt Lloyd from MIT. Uh, this is a great honor. Professor Lloyd uh, has been uh, associated with the notion of the, the computational fabric of reality uh, from, uh, from the foundations uh, to quantum science onward. So it's a pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I will not use PowerPoint um, because my vision for the future is a life without bullet points. <laughs> Microsoft PowerPoint is Satan. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, and, and indeed, um, in all this emphasis, emphasis about the great connectivity of the world and the internet, I think that we're overlooking the benefits of a lack of connectivity. Um, uh, my brother, Tom, founded an institution called the Anti-Social Network. Uh, has anybody here received an email from us about this? Good, good, good. If you get one, it's not from us. Anybody can join, just don't contact us about it. We promise never to contact you, never to advertise anything, and under no circumstances will we put you in a big database and look to see whether you're a terrorist. <laughs> um, uh, Mario suggested I talk about quantum biology here. But, and, and actually, I, I do, do want to say just one or two things to follow up on Paolo Zanardi's talk. Um, so uh, the first thing is, when we invented this design for adiabatic quantum computing, I guess we should have patented it, because D-Wave then went and took it. And the reason we didn't patent it is that we thought it wasn't going to work. Um, and indeed, I think the current D-Wave system is failing to work, but in extremely interesting and scientifically basic ways. So they're doing us a great favor for this. However, I'd just like to advertise this weekend, we're going to post a bunch of papers about, well, about I guess I call the topic, big quantum data, um, which is, the idea is actually what, very similar to what Paolo, Paolo, well, what Paolo was doing as an example of this, if you can encode classical information into the state of a very small number of quantum bits, um, so a database that's the size of the whole universe, where there are two to the 300 elementary particles, could be encoded in 300 quantum bits. Then all the, most of the manipulations you do, like for machine learning and these kinds of things, for big data processing, can actually be done in time exponentially shorter than they can be done on classical computers. And Paolo's uh, work is an example of this. So I think this is an exciting potential use of quantum mechanics. Um, but I'd really like to talk to you about, about um, what quantum mechanics is good for. Now, in fact, I think that quantum computing is that even though it's gotten you know, a lot of attention recently, um, is in some sense uh, not the most societally relevant application of quantum mechanics. I indeed, if you actually look at the, the Nobel Prize for this year to Serge Roche and Dave Wineland, um, it was given, um, actually Dave Wineland you know, is one of the great figures of quantum computing, but the reason that he started to build ion trap quantum computers was he wanted to build a better atomic clock. And indeed, they, they build the most accurate optical frequency atomic clocks in the world in, at NIST. And this is squarely based on notions from quantum information processing. You have to take an atomic transition, optical transition, and entangle it with a microwave transition, and then use this entanglement to be able to read out the optical clock, which is so accurate that, in fact, if you move it up like this, it ticks notably, slow, noticeably slower because the gravitational field has changed slightly. So Dave Wineland says it's the world's most accurate altimeter. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to see what to use it for. So, so in fact, um, applications of quantum mechanics at the fundamental level of sensing and measurement are extremely important, and quantum information is the way to understand what's going on there. And what I'd like to tell you about today, in um, the next eight minutes, uh, is a, 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 an application to energy transport. So, um, in fact, if you look at problems of energy, the world has a, lot, a big energy problem right now. Um, I don't think it's going to be solved by any one thing, like solar power or wind power or, um, uh, or nuclear power. It's going to be kind of an all above, above kind of thing. But in order to contribute to this, we really need to understand how energy gets processed and transformed at the microscopic scale. Now, um, about five years ago, actually almost six years ago now, there were, uh, was a remarkable piece of experimental paper from the Fleming Group at Berkeley showing that the process of photosynthesis relies intrinsically on quantum mechanics and quantum coherence to attain its very high efficiency. Because photosynthetic transport 
energy transport and photosynthesis is almost 98% efficient. And there's no way to explain this without the existence of strong degree of quantum coherence. And in fact, what I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell you about, as I will give you, a, uh, since I don't have a, a PowerPoint and I don't have anything to write on, I will actually explain to you the quantum theory of how to optimize energy transport in photosynthesis or optimize electron transport in, in graphene or any kind of energy or transport in a quantum system. And I will not, I will just do this as an interpretive modern dance and um, then you'll just have to accept, I won't draw, make any equations, you'll have to accept that the equations that mathematize this interpretive modern dance give the correct theory and describe quantitatively the, the actual experiments that we see. So how does photosynthesis work? Uh, a, 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 par, a photon, a particle of light, comes in, it hits a photosynthetic complex, like in green plants. This is full of chromophores, and chromophores are little like boxes for holding energy. So it, it hits a chromophore, but the, this is the stuff that makes plants green, and it creates an exciton. An exciton is a particle of energy, a particle of excitation, as its name would suggest. It's really a bound electron hole pair that has a bunch of energy. And this whole pair, this exciton hops from chromophore to chromophore to chromophore to chromophore to chromophore. And eventually it gets to the reaction center where it can be turned into useful stuff like fat. Uh, though I have to say the dinner last night was extremely delicious, but it wasn't fattening. Uh, <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> so now, it's here where quantum mechanics plays a very important role because what the experiments show is that this process of hopping from chromophore to chromophore is highly quantum mechanical, involves quantum coherence. Um, and actually in some places, the, the, the exciton, which behaves like a quantum particle, actually goes quite a long way in a coherent fashion before something happens to it. So then, of course, it also interacts with the environment. These systems are disordered. So how does this work and how do you optimize coherence in these systems? Okay. Now I will do my little dance here. So remember that in quantum mechanics, things that are particles have waves that correspond to them. Okay? This is called wave-particle duality. Now the nice thing about waves is that waves, as they wiggle up and down, can propagate like a wave of water or a wave of sound. Now this is actually a quite efficient way for getting from one place to another because if you compare this with like a random walk, like uh, uh, sadly we didn't have to drink enough wine, though those funny drinks we had at the beginning of the dinner last night could have induced this effect. A random walk, you get moved to places considerably more slowly and randomly. So you would like in the quantum system to do excitonic transport or electron transport, you'd like to emphasize this wave-like nature of quantum transport so that you're energy and information can propagate in a nice, consistent and smooth fashion. All right? Everybody happy already? Yes. I, as a professor of mechanical engineering, I need feedback from people, so... <laughs> yeah. Okay. However, there is a problem, which is that these photosynthetic systems have disorder in them. They're not perfectly smooth crystals. They have energy defects. They're, there's things that are messed up. There's all kinds of interactions with the environment. And particularly, there is the energy levels of the, these chromophores differ as you go along. And the result is a phenomenon known as Anderson localization, first described by Phil Anderson. And the point is that this wave, as it moves along, it becomes less and less coherent. And eventually, the kind of phases of these waves get confused. And at that point, you get stuck. So you're propagating along in a wave-like fashion, and then you just get stuck. And you get really stuck. So the, the very surprising thing about Anderson localization is once you're stuck, you're going nowhere. So this is bad for energy transport. So what happens is if you want to destroy a localization, you need to get rid of this bad wave-like behavior, so-called coherence, that got you stuck in the first place. And now this is the, a useful thing comes into, uh, into effect, which is that the environment is already wiggling up and, up and down. And when you have these random fast motions that are always kicking you, then this actually frees you up so you can actually propagate again. So the real picture is like this. Here I'm, I'm a wave particle on a wave moving along, I get stuck from localization, but because I'm being whacked by the environment in various ways, I can get freed up and then I can propagate again until I get stuck again. 
Speed up, propagate again. <laughs> okay. Now, okay, so that sounds good. It sounds as if you add noise to this system, you can actually make it behave more efficiently. However, if you add too much noise, then you're just like, oh, and you're going nowhere because you're just like being whacked around by the environment all the time, and that's bad. So there is an optimal rate of what we call decoherence, an optimal level of noise, which when you combine it with the notion of having this coherent propagation, will give you the optimal transport. Now, it's actually not surprising. I think you can guess what this optimal rate is. What you want is you want to have the, you, you to get freed up by the environment on just the same time scale that you propagate and get localized. So technically, if you set the decoherence time equal to the localization time, you get optimal transport. And in fact, so and you, you can also calculate how much better you do if you're on this side, if you have, if you have too little decoherence, how much worse you do if you have uh, too much decoherence. You can make a, a quantitative model of this. And in fact, if you look at photosynthetic systems and you measure these parameters in photosynthetic systems where there's an astonishing diversity of different ways of propagating energy, you find that all of them exist exactly at this point, this optimal point of the interplay between coherence and decoherence. And so um, uh, this is because this is a, you know, a quantitative yet hand-waving model, we're applying it to all kinds of things like um, uh, propagation in graphene so that we can get grants by mentioning graphene uh, and in propagation of electrons, et cetera. But I think that the coherence in quantum mechanics is not merely about quantum computing. It's really the secret for all kinds of microscopic processes from energy transport to speeding up chemical reactions um, to making things work better at the microscopic level. And uh, I, 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 I'll just close by saying, I, I actually went into the field that's now called quantum information before it was called that, because I said, now this is a really interesting and fundamental field and nobody's working on it. And I, I, I want to work in a field where I'm guaranteed that nobody will ever win a Nobel Prize. Because when there's a lot of people who want to win Nobel Prizes around, you know, they get nasty and the water gets like muddied and stuff like that. But unfortunately, now somebody won a Nobel Prize for this. So there goes the neighborhood. So <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Did you come in with choreography?